Hi guys, it's Blackie. Okay, today we're going to be cutting up some stuff, put into a bush pot, and make a real simple stew. Now, this is one of those stews that's really good on a cold morning. Now, we're going to combine some of the things we've talked about earlier. Rather than boiling in water, we're going to boil in beef stock because that adds flavor. We're going to cook potatoes. And I prefer red potatoes for making any kind of quick stews and things because red potatoes boil soft quicker, okay? Now the meat we're going to be using is corned beef, canned corned beef. And corned is kind of a misnomer. It's actually been pickled in a brine, so it's been preserved. So that's the reason all corned beef has that certain flavor. And most people are famous for corned beef and cabbage and that type deal. But trust me, if you ever ate MREs, you're tasting corned beef because they use a lot of corned beef in any kind of beef dish in MREs because it is sort of preserved a little better. It carries a little better. And so that's why. The procedure is we're going to take and first we're going to dice up a pepper. We're going to dice up some onion. We're going to smash up a piece of garlic, chop it up, and we're going to put it in there. And then we're going to... Um, Add the beef stock, bring it to a bowl, and we're going to cut up our taters into cubes, smaller pieces. Now you can slice potatoes as well, and I'm probably going to do that for this one. I'm just going to slice them into old pencil thick slices and drop them in so it's a half sheet of potato rather than, because it's small potatoes. The, the thing is, by reducing the overall size of the hunk of potato, it goes soft faster. A full-size potato, you'd have to boil it for probably an hour to get it all the way to the core soft. Whereas if you start cutting it up, you can cut your cooking time down. And we're going to try to limit the cooking time to 20, 25 minutes. Okay, we're going to be using my Coleman stove for this just for sheer convenience. But you could, of course, do this on a fire. Now, could I change the taste? Absolutely. This, any type of cooking like this is wide open. I could add peppers for spices. I could take butter and put the onions and the peppers and the garlic in the bottom of the pot first, heat it up and kind of saute and kind of brown that a little bit before I add the other components to it. That will change the overall taste. Spices, I haven't gone into how you spice them yet because it's a personal preference. And so you're not going to see me adding a bunch of salt and pepper and sugar and etc. to my recipes. It's simply because my taste and your taste are different. And if I say I add a quarter tablespoon of black pepper to something, that may be way too much for you. So when it's about 90% done, that's when the cook and only the cook is allowed to season. That prevents campfire problems where I taste it. Oh, it needs more. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this guy over here, oh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. And after a while, nobody can eat it because it's got all this crap in it. So, only the cook in camp is the one that seasons it. Okay? He seasons it, then he hands it off to you. Once you have it, if it's not hot enough and you want to light it up with some Tabasco or something, go right ahead. But don't do the whole pot for everybody because not everybody wants it as hot as you do. So you see what I'm saying? Only the cook spices it. And then after that, everybody else will play with it. So, let's get started. Now, the knife in question, because somebody's going to ask, this is the WCSK prototype that I got back whenever me and William and Dan Lutz were developing the WCSK and I was doing field testing. This is the uh, one of the first, I think was, they were like four or five, ten models, but this was the final one before production. This was the like the final proof of the WCSK. So this is the prototype and that's what I'm going to be using for chopping up my vegetables with. Because it's a great kitchen knife for this type of thing as well, as well as being a survival knife. So, let's get to cutting up some vegetables. Okay, I got my bush pot ready to go so I can just drop my vegetables in as I cut them up. I got my knife at the ready. Now I've got a bag of baby red potatoes that are fairly clean. If Always when you pull them out, take a good look, make sure they're not dirty. If so, you go ahead and wash them. In fact, it's a good precaution to go ahead and wash all your vegetables before you do this. I've got one big Vidalia onion. I've got one red pepper. 
and I've got one whole clove of garlic. Now I'm not going to use a whole clove for this. I'm just going to take my thumb and I'm going to try to open this up and get me down to one clove off of it. I'll save it and use the rest of it for spaghetti sauce and other things. Okay, one clove of garlic. Rest of it over there on my handy little table for later. Peel off, make sure I got all the leaf off of this. The easy way to do it, just put it up there and give it a good and that paper will bust loose, which is actually leaves. And I've seen that little trick where you put a garlic into a little thing, a little glass jar of water and shake it up real good and it'll break off free, but I ain't that fancy. All right, now, with my garlic, I'm gonna take it turn it in several little slices. And then that is going to go into the bush pot. Next, let's take that red pepper. Let's go ahead and get rid of that label right there. seeds as much as possible. Like that. Now that center section kind of tough, so we don't want it. A little bit of it right there. Slice that off nice and easy. We used to call it witch's tongue, my granny did. So you cut the witch's tongue out of them because it was tough. Alrighty. And one more. And that. That may be alright. If we just square it up like that. Okay. Now I'm not going to chop this horribly fine. I'm just going to do it like this and make slivers out of it. And then turn it and do it one more time. Rock that. Bring up the pot. Cooking in camp shouldn't be a big, huge chore. And often it's a good idea to rotate the duty. Where you, a lot of times you're going to have that one person, they just enjoy the cooking. And that's great. But if they don't, you know, rotate around. Let somebody else have an opportunity. And give you a break. We used to do week long camp outs. We'd designate one person who's going to be the cook for. Monday, one person for Tuesday, etc. And that way we rotate it around. Alright. Take off the top. Take it about in half. Just like that. Yeah, that's about all onion I want. Save the rest of this for later. piece right there is a little thick and that we're good <laughs> you know usually out here in the country where I'm at there ain't hardly any traffic there ain't hardly nothing but this is Thanksgiving holiday weekend and there's a pile of vehicles everybody's going to grandma's house I guess Run it up and down the road. Yeah, it'd be fine. Alright, I'm just going to quarter these up. 
cut in half, cut in half again, like that. Now, how many potatoes are you going to put in? Well, there's a ratio. It's been my experience that if you're trying to feed a lot of people, more potatoes are better because it goes further. On the other hand, if you've not and you've got more meat than anything else, focus it more on the meat, less on the potatoes. Potatoes are a good filler and they kind of pump up what you're cooking to give you a maximum amount of cooking capability. Now you could peel them. I ain't gonna mess with it because the skins are just fine for this. Baby reds will quickly um, get soft. No skin don't bother me at all in the final product. They add flavor and to me that's what the flavor is in the potatoes actually in the skin. So, these young new potatoes. Many times I've cut up, there's an escapee. I've cut up potatoes like this with just a pocket knife rather than using a big knife like this. But the WCSK, for those that ain't really that familiar, the letter stood for is the William Collins Survival Knife. But WCSK also stood for W Woodsman, anything that a woodsman needed. Game prep, fire prep, splitting, batoning, that type deal. And a uh, S, survival knife. What was the most radical thing you could think of? You'd have to ask a knife to do. We came up with that. C, combat knife. It was something that our troops had to be able to use as a pry bar to open things, wedge doors shut, whatever, because that was something that was very prevalent in combat at the time. And then, finally, and to me, one of the most important, K for kitchen. It had to be able to serve as a good kitchen knife. Because that's what's overlooked a lot of times in a lot of the knife, um, you know, it's a quote, quote, survival knife. And it's hardened to this or that. And man, you can drive it in a stump and hook a chain to it and pull the world around. Yeah, but it's dang near useless to actually sit and try to do this with. Because it's so big and thick and awkward. You can't cut up food, you can't use it in the kitchen, you can't slice, you can't whatever. It's great as a, like I said, a sharpened 2 by 4 but it's not a great thing as far as an actual using that. And that comes from experience. So when we were doing the WCSK, that was one prime consideration. It had to be able to function like you're seeing it here. It had to be a pretty good kitchen knife as well, and it's a really good kitchen knife. In fact, I have to hide mine, or Mrs. Blackie will have it in the kitchen doing stuff, whether I like it or not. You see I'm slicing a few extras. Just make a few center slices. Got so many hunks. And it slices really easy. We're about there. And then I got left two potatoes in there. So I'll go ahead and get those two potatoes. It worked out to be about right. It's one reason I like in bags of small baby potatoes. If you could, if you wanted to, you could actually make um, potato chips with this knife. It'll just slice them very, very thin. That's what you're going for. Like that. See through. Alright, finally. Now, as you can see, my pot is about 
half full. Okay. Now to this, I'm going to add a can of diced tomatoes. But I'm not going to use the tomato juice. I'm going to squeeze that out a little bit. All right, tomatoes. Okay. And then finally, we're going to take the beef broth. And that's going to be the liquid that we're going to submerge everything in. where it's just a little over just like that and I still got a little bit of beef broth left that's fine I can add that as it cooks now I've got a package of brown gravy I will save this until the end now you notice I hadn't put the meat in yet there's a reason for that I want to cook this for about 10-15 minutes that canned corned beef is already basically cooked I just need to Heat it real good and if I add it now it's going to add the flavor of the corned beef to everything and the whole pot is going to taste like corned beef I want there to be subtleness of differences of the flavors I want that garlic and that onion and that pepper and the tomatoes to all blend to become like a roux see and then at the end that's when I'll add this in about the last five minutes till then I want this to cook so and like I said the gravy mix, if it's not thick enough when I'm done, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of this, a tablespoon of this, and stir it to thicken it just a little. A little trick. Okay, let me get it on the fire. Okay, now she's coming up temp. This is what you want. You want on a low simmer. Take your time. You want to give all the flavors a chance to mix. Give it a stir every so often, make sure nothing's sticking in the bottom. But since, no, notice I put all the peppers and the onions and stuff in first, and then the potatoes on top, everything in here is really moist, it doesn't dry. And so therefore, less likely to burn because it is such a high moisture content, and the fact it's sitting in liquid. So I'm keeping the, the heat at a medium high right now, and it's coming up. Once it gets to a good rolling boil, I'll let it boil about 20 minutes. I'll be back with you when that's going. Okay, we're at a good boil now. We'll just come in ever so often. Give her a good stir. Keep everything wet. Don't let it get dry. Okay. Now, I looked away for a minute, got sidetracked, and I bubbled over because I let it boil too hard. It's fine. I'll hose out my Coleman stove afterwards. I'll take everything out, take my hose, ro roll it out, and it'll be fine. Just don't let it harden in there, so do a little cleanup. Keep your stove and your equipment as clean as you can. Now, remember I said I saved a little bit of that uh, stock? Now I'm going to add it in because I did lose a little bit. It's a good dash. Keep it at a roll. Keep it cooking. Now, after about a total of 20 minutes of boil, then we'll check it for doneness. Then we'll add the meat if it's ready. Okay. Now, let's check the potatoes. Grab a hunk of potato. Hey there, Gingy. Yes, you smell me cooking, don't you? We're going to let that cool a minute. And then as soon as it cools, I'll taste it. If it is, say, 90% done, I'll go ahead and add the meat. If it's still crunchy in the middle, I'll give it another 5 or 10 minutes. That's how you gauge it. Your potatoes are going to tell you when the dish is ready. Now, suppose I accidentally put too much salt into a dish. I can add potatoes, and potatoes will actually suck salt back out of a dish, and therefore go into the potato so it doesn't taste salty. Hmm. 
Mm, not quite. We'll give it another about 10 minutes and then we'll check it. Okay, now we've had about the right amount of time. Onions, the potatoes, the tomatoes, and the garlic have all worked together. Now I'll take a taste of my onion, excuse me, my potato. And yes, yes, Ginger, you're going to get some. Okay. Don't be turning over the tripod. Okay. Potato is about 80% done. That means time to add the meat. I'm going to leave it uncovered like this to lose a little bit extra water while I cut up the meat. Just make life easy. <laughs> Don't be knocking over the tripod. <laughs> Oh, Ginger is happy that it's cool outside and she wants to love and rub up against everything. Alright. Now these old cans of corned beef have a tab on them. So you pop, pull off the key, turn the key around the other way, and put it back on. And now you start winding it. Now I think we go this way. On there. Now, nope, we go back toward me. Alright. There we go. Break it loose and start winding. When I was a kid, this is the way a lot of things, bam, used to come with a thing like this. So you'd unwind it. Kept metal from getting into the food. So like a can opener would be possibly punching little bitty tabs of metal into the food. This tear does not. Take the lid off. Give it a little bit of a squeeze to get air in it. It should come out. There, half of it. Now, corned beef is more like a loaf, kind of like spam, than it is a a. Uh, Something like a solid pack. And also, all we're going to do is just bust it up into smaller hunks like this. I don't want it terrible tiny. I want, when you pick it up and bite down, you know you're getting a hunk of the meat. And at the same time, I don't want it to be anything that. You know, so small it just becomes like a slurry. Alright. Now that's been diced up. Time to put it into the pot. Now, turn that wire bale out of our way. Come up here and start raking in chunks. After you put a few in, Give it a stir. Okay. Then add some more. Obviously the game is to get it in there and get it worked all the way to the bottom. So it ain't just a hunk in the middle or on top, but it's all the way to the bottom. Just kind of push and lift up your spoon and then grab and pull from the other direction. 
than that has got there all that in there now to clean the board wash it off salt it real good and rub it with good table salt and now clean that board up now as a finishing touch we're going to take our brown gravy mix and we're just going to add in just about a tablespoon worth of the mix about that much sprinkling around the top now stir it into the bottom and that will thicken it up just a little bit there we go now we got a full pot now of stew and we're going to give this five minutes for it to regulate out heat up thoroughly come back up to temp and all those flavors to mix okay just hang with me and we'll be back for the conclusion very simple stew to create it's going to have your potatoes tomatoes onions garlic and etc. in it. And notice it becomes little bitty pieces of meat. Not big humps of meat. And that makes for a quick easy meal. Now, I'll let that simmer a few more minutes to turn my heat down. Okay. Why corned beef? It's already cooked. It adds a good deal of flavor gives you a lot of fat and calories on a cold day the primary texture that you're going to be eating that's going to give you some some mouth feel and good cooking is a lot about chemistry and presentation it's what's the mouth feel you could puree all of it and put it in one thing and it kind of tastes like blah you got to have the individual notes so in this you're going to have potato you're going to have onion you're going to have pepper, you're going to have garlic, you're going to have the beef taste, you're going to have that slight gravy taste, and you're going to have that corned beef. Now that corned beef is going to percolate through small pieces, kind of like chili, okay? So when I go to eat, all I got to do is just scoop up in a spoon and eat potato, and I'm going to have the meat and everything with it people that use stew meat. Stew meat is really good, but stew meat, by definition, is normally very tough meat. The reason they're selling it is stew meat. And it's normally cubed up, and you got to cook it usually a fairly long time to make it tender. On the opposite of that, you got to go buy a good tender cut of meat and then cube it up to make stew meat out of it. For camping at, uh, and cooking at camp, I found that something was quick and easy. Could you use Spam for this? Absolutely. There are many flavors of Spam that you could carve up and put in this. And one of my favorite dishes that I've cooked several times on camera was Camp Taters. And all it is is mashed potatoes and Spam of some variety that's been cooked and then heated together and put together. So as you're eating the potatoes, you hit hunks of meat. Okay. With this, it becomes a fine hunks of meat, clumps of meat in there. So you get a spoonful and you'll taste a, a big meat note. You know. And so it's it's every bite will be different and that's what keeps it interesting because when you're cooking you don't want it to be bland and every spoonful tastes identical to the last so add in peppers add in salt add in whatever you need for you but as i said the cook is the one who actually does the spicing once it's in your bowl and it's your portion sky's the limit dude throw whatever you want in there i have a, a good friend michael Ilya, that uh he thinks there's nothing in it because it's got ghost peppers in it. Uh, he can eat the hot stuff. and he, uh -uh. You know, love him to death. He's a brother. But at the same time, I'm always looking when he said, there ain't nothing in it. I'm always a weary eye dipping a little bit first to check it out because he likes it a lot hotter than I do. And so any kind of cooking, if you're cooking for a group, cook it kind of bland and let everybody spice it themselves. Hope you enjoyed this, guys. Please hit that like, share, and subscribe button before you go. And please leave any questions or comments you got down below. I'll be happy to hear from you. I'll be glad to respond the best I can. 
Till next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.